As you can probably tell, I'm shooting from my parents' house today, which means I finally get a look how smart I am bookcase background. Impressed? Those shelves are full. Today we're talking about Afghanistan, the large asterisk in America's we don't negotiate with terrorists stance. This week a historic meeting is taking place between the Taliban leadership and the government of Afghanistan to try and just duct tape together a government that both sides look at and say, eh, this is bad, but not bad enough that I want to burn it all down. It's a real 2016 election of less than mediocre options. One of the largest foreign policy positions of the Trump administration has been a concerted effort to get the heck out of Afghanistan at almost any cost. This includes the previously unthinkable strategy of negotiating directly with the Taliban. Alright, we hear you. Death to America. But can we meet you in the middle somewhere? How about just injuring America? I mean, have you seen our COVID response? This negotiation strategy replaced the previous strategy of maybe more bombs? This meeting is the culmination of four years of US foreign policy efforts. Unfortunately, the sheer fact that these negotiations are taking place in the first place is a pretty damning indictment of America's progress in the region. They're happening because every analyst out there is predicting that. If we leave right now, the government we've taken 18 years trying to set up and prop up will quickly fall to the Taliban. Comparisons to the outcome of the Vietnam War are everywhere. With that, let's meet the major players in this negotiation, starting with Taliban leader Abdul Ghani Bardar. His starting position in this conversation is not exactly fertile ground for compromise. The Taliban opposes elections and it seeks a country governed by a strict interpretation of Islamic law. Alright, I hear you. How about only local elections and a government based on strict interpretation of Buddhist law? The Taliban justice minister did recently try to pitch this style of governance to the American people saying, you have accepted Saudi Arabia and we wouldn't do more than their basic code. Retribution for murder, chop off the hand for robbing. If you have accepted Saudi, what's wrong with us being another? The rest will be your priorities, aid, friendship, economic relations. Of course, the problem here is, if you're thinking, great, a Saudi Arabian level of human rights abuses. Hate that, but I'll be able to sleep tonight. Well, I wouldn't throw away the ambient quite yet. We're talking constitutions right now, not law. Copying someone's constitution and expecting the society to turn out even remotely similar is like building on a lot similar to the one the White House was built on and just sort of assuming the end product will be the same because of that. What? The soil's pH was exactly the same. How did I end up with a three-story walk-up? You still have to color in that constitution with laws. The constitution just determines how power is distributed in a society and what the powerful can get away with. It's what you point to when you yell at your lawmakers, you can't do that, it's unconstitutional. I mean Joaquin Phoenix and Jared Leto both pulled from the same source material for the Joker and one won an Oscar while the other sent used condoms to a bunch of people. Need I say more? They can turn out differently. Afghanistan operating under a Saudi constitution would almost certainly look very different and probably worse than Saudi Arabia today. The next negotiator today is Afghanistan representative Masoon Stenitsky. The government wants to preserve the country's democracy, human rights, and civil liberties. Their starting point is defending the status quo and trying to maintain as much of the existing American backed constitution as possible. They're really saying, let's go defense. Alarmingly though, both Afghanistan President Asraf Ghani and his rival Abdullah Abdullah have cautioned the Afghans living under the government control that they will probably have to make sacrifices as peak stocks progress. Tell you what, we'll let you operate the DMV under strict Islamic law. Deal? 
The chairman of Afghanistan's High Council for National Reconciliation, Abdullah Abdullah, did draw a line in the sand recently, saying, For me, one person, one vote. I don't call anything a red line, but that's critical, and compromises on those things would not get us to peace. Now, the last character in this story is America, whose goal recently transformed from the Bush-Obama emphasis of defending and strengthening the Afghan government to the Trump emphasis of rolling out. Hey, Afghanistan, figure it out. You think we're going to stick around and defend your rights? That's the girds of that strategy of waiting worked out. So, with the players out of the way, let's get to the meat of the negotiations. Each of these players has a few tricks up their sleeves to succeed. For example, the Taliban could currently wipe out the Afghan government, but only after America leaves. Now That gives them a pretty powerful hand, because if they don't like whatever agreement they sign on to, they have an option to just hit the reset button as soon as America is out. On the other hand, though, this has led to a strategy from Afghan President Asraf Ghani to move as slowly as bureaucratically possible on peace talks. He's trying to run out the clock until November. And let me tell you, if anyone wants Biden to win, it's that guy. Every deal the United States has negotiated with the Taliban, he's delayed for as long as possible. And considering Trump has been trying to remove troops for four years and the inner Afghanistan peace talks just started, I'd say mission accomplished on that front. Over the course of this year, Afghan President Asraf Ghani has deployed a range of tactics, including balking at the release of Taliban prisoners, to defer the initiation of the inner Afghanistan dialogue. Even after the initiation of talks, he is likely to continue the use of obstructionist tactics at least into the November elections. Then, of course, you have Trump, who is overseeing these negotiations like a guy who really wants to get off the phone with his granddad. Yeah, 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 you want an Islamic kingdom? Well, that sounds like something you're really going to have to take up with Afghanistan. I really have to go, though. Uh, November elections are coming. Go going through t tunnel. That'll work out. So what's next? Well, the first thing being discussed is, should we stop killing each other? The Afghan government has prioritized a ceasefire, but the Taliban says it will agree to one only after a political settlement has been reached, meaning at the end of negotiations. Yeah, I haven't quite gotten to the peace part of the priest process cut yet. And if one side wants to keep shooting, that generally means both sides are going to keep shooting. Of course, the Taliban's goal here is to make that region as toxic as possible for foreign politicians so that they'll want to leave as soon as possible. Beyond the ceasefire debate, though, things are looking even worse for the Afghan government in every corner in these negotiations. Given that US forces will likely depart next year no matter who is president, former Vice President Joe Biden essentially agrees with Trump on this issue. The Taliban has little reason to make major concessions now. I mean, you don't fold when you have a royal flush in your hand. There is little reason to believe that the Taliban would now be comfortable with the compromises of parliamentary democracy in which individual rights are guaranteed. Instead, when the Taliban was in power, it stoned gay people, prevented women from working or getting an education, and enforced theocratic rule under its supreme leader. Now, I'll be honest guys, when I started writing about successfully starting the intra-Afghanistan peace process, I wasn't anticipating something quite this depressing. Let's recork that champagne for a bit, shall we? At this point in the talks, it seems less like a peace deal and more like a negotiated surrender that could either take months or years. Despite the fact that this feels like we're entering the final chapter in a very depressing book, this is quite a long chapter, and if 2020 can be described as anything, it's unpredictable. I'll keep following this peace process as the war and debates continue. Until then, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. 
Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.